So why aren't some people healed? You've asked the question? Maybe you yourself have not been healed. I don't claim to have all of the answers as to why everybody is not healed, but I have a few because of during the time we've ministered, I have run into a number of problems and we have tried to find out the answers for you. I hate to see people being accused over and over and over again that they don't have enough faith and that's their problem because this can make people very, very um, hard to understand and they feel very badly and they start going on a guilt trip and they start feeling very unworthy. I think a lot of times there's just lacking in understanding as to why people are not healed and I want to go into some of those reasons right now. But I think we ought to take a look first of all at James chapter 5 verses 13 through to 16. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now it would appear here in this portion of scripture as well that sins do have something to play with regards to the fact that we are not healed. Well, let's go into that just a wee little bit. And it does say here, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. I know that there are some people who carry inner bitterness, resentment, anger towards other people. And because of this, they end up having physical ailments. For an example, have you ever heard anybody say, I just can't stomach that person. I can't stomach them. Guess what problem they might have? Ulcers? <laughs> Sour stomach? Oftentimes, the very words that we speak are factual to what we, the problems that we have. So great. You have that person now come up under your hands and you say, Dear Lord, I pray now, or I minister to, or in the name of Jesus Christ, ulcers be healed. But the person still hasn't gotten over the other person who gives them the sour stomach. They've still got the bitterness. They've still got the resentment. So how is their stomach going to be healed? Do you see what I'm trying to say? In the confessing your faults one to another that you may be healed, the thing is this, we need to go to that person and confess then probably how we've been feeling and get it off of our chest and ask them to forgive us. Are we to forgive them or whatever has to be done? Then I've had people come to me and they say, you know, that fella gets under my skin. I just can't stand him. And they're scratching away. They do, literally. That bitterness or that resentment causes the person really to get right under their skin. And what do they have? They scratch, they got itches, they've got blotches on their skin. Now, I am not saying that every time somebody has a skin problem that they've got some bitterness or resentment. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I have to be so careful, you know, what I say because people can take me wrong. So what do we do? Maggie Muggins comes up under your hands and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command the skin to be made whole. So the skin is made whole for overnight. And then, you know, they come back the next day. You know something? That left, that left me and, and you know, now it's back again. I guess I wasn't healed. Well, I guess not. And I really have a problem with people trying to convince me that they were when they weren't. <laughs> so, what happens? They, obviously then, if, that's, if the problem has been caused because they have some bitterness against their mother-in-law or their father-in-law or aunt or uncle or their wife or their husband, 
and that person still gets under their skin, the thing is going to come out again, flare up, right? That's what's causing the problem. I had one woman come to me that, um, as I laid hands on her and ministered to her, it was revealed that she was holding some resentment inside of her. And I said, honey, look, you know, that thing that's chewing on you, you've got to get rid of it. You've got to give it to Jesus. You've got to forgive that person that you've been holding this grudge against for so long, the unforgiving spirit. Get rid of it, honey. Come on. Confess it to the Lord right now and get it out of the way. And she did. She cried, and she had got great relief in her inner spirit. It's no wonder sometimes doctors can't cure some of these things. You know, they put salve on it, and it heals it a little bit, you know, but keeps coming back and coming back. You've got to get at the core of it. So the woman goes home. The next day she calls me. I'm healed, I'm healed. I said, really, what, what? She says, my skin, my skin is all healed. She says, I don't have any marks left on. I said, well, I don't remember ministering to your skin. She says, you didn't. You see, the problem, God revealed the problem. And instead of saying, Lord, heal the skin, the inner thing was healed and she got forgiveness inside. And now the skin automatically healed of its own accord because Jesus touched it and healed it. I think maybe we're starting to understand a little bit more. You know the problems that come with people? They say, oh, that person makes my blood boil. What do they got? Poof, high blood pressure. <laughs> that fella drives me crazy. My boss drives me crazy. Well, they might even be a nervous wreck at that point. That person gives me a pain in the neck, and that's literally what they got, a pain in the neck. How do you minister to this type of a thing? All right, so the doctor says it's all psychosomatic. Other people say it's psychosomatic. All right, I agree to this point that maybe some of the ailments that we have are those things that need an inner healing, and it takes forgiveness. It takes the principles laid down in the Word of God to be able to break the power of those things because they literally affect the human body. Praise God for understanding in it. There was a woman who came to me with a very serious problem. She really looked like a nervous wreck. She was. She almost looked like she should have been in the psychopathic ward in one of the hospitals. We sat down and talked. She told me the story of her life. She says, 20 years ago, my husband was unfaithful to me, got involved with another woman. And she says, I became so bitter and resentful towards him that I decided to go out and get involved with another man. And I did. And she says, I ended up becoming pregnant. Then she says, I decided at that point I would have an abortion. And she did. Now, from that point on, this woman carried a guilt trip regarding that thing that she had done. Twenty solid years this woman has been carrying a sense of guilt in her life over the fact that she had had an abortion and had done what she had done with this other man. She said, I had gone to my minister. I had gone to other people to try to receive forgiveness. I had asked God to forgive me. She says, I just, I just can't, I can't get over it. I said, in other words, honey, you feel like you have to help God, do you now? You have to beat yourself over the back a thousand and one times to help God finish the work that he did for you on the cross. Jesus Christ paid the price for you on the cross, and it says, by his stripes, you are healed. And he says, who forgives all of thine iniquities. Now, I said, your physical body is in need of healing at this point because I said, your mind is just run ragged. You have to have a sense of forgiveness inside of you. And one thing, honey, you've got to do is forgive yourself. You've got to forgive yourself. Bible says he remembers our sins against us no more. He puts them actually in the sea of his forgetfulness. He buries them there. He can never, never even remember them. Isn't that neat? But what do we do? 
We go out fishing. That's what we do. You know what it's like when you go out fishing and there's a sign up there that says no fishing? But we take our little rod and reel. Oh, yes, we do. And we put the old hook on it and we throw it in. And it lands in the water. And we let it fall and we drag up that old sin again. Take another look at it. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, I feel awful. Well, honey, you shouldn't have been out there fishing. Because God said he, he buried it to never to be brought back again. And yet we still have to go and haul it in and take another look at it and feel badly again. Now, I said, for 20 years, that's what you've been doing. You've asked God for forgiveness, and God has forgiven you. Honey, you don't have to carry that the rest of your life. It's forgiven. Why carry it around with you, honey? Now, are you ready to lay down that rod, that reel, huh? Are you ready to do that? Because I know the minute that you will do that, you will have that completely removed off of you. I said, let's pray. And I took her hands, and I said, oh, thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness of sin. And this precious little darling has been carrying this around with her for years. I know that you have forgiven her. Your word says that you have. And she is now made whole. Well, you see, originally she came to me because she was a nervous wreck. What can I do? I just don't feel well. I got the jitters. I can't eat. I can't sleep. What am I going to do? Lay my hands on her and pray for her and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be made whole. The thing is, she needed forgiveness of sin. That's what she needed. And now when I got through praying, tears were streaming down from her eyes, and she says, I feel like a great burden has just been lifted off of my shoulders. And I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Her face looked completely different. She now had forgiven herself. But you see, we try to help God, and the more we can beat ourselves over the back for our sins and our iniquities. He didn't do a good enough job on the cross. Do you know that? Because the more we try to help him by not forgiving ourselves, and the more we try to help him, uh, you know, by making ourselves feel afflicted and miserable, don't be happy. Whatever you do, don't be a happy Christian. <laughs> you might let people know that Jesus Christ sets you free by doing that. We're going to be, you know, sad. <laughs> Don't glorify God in your body by claiming healing. <laughs> Go around and suffer. Now, there is a lot of teaching on, quote, suffering saints and I know that there are areas where we're called upon to go through types of suffering but the type of suffering that is plagued by the enemy is not my style of suffering and I know that there is great beauty that comes out of suffering but certain types of suffering so here we have then Inner healing that is very, very important. And, and this, I think, is what's talking about here in James chapter 5. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, I know that there's some people get together in their little groups, and they start confessing their sins to each other. This is basically what they do. They're just, just there to confess their sins and their faults and their failures. And I have seen people come out of some of those types of meetings worse than when they went in. I kid you not. If you want to sit and look at everybody's sins and look at all of their failures and their faults and expect to even just be healed by doing this, you never will. The only way we're ever going to be healed is taking them to the foot of the cross, leaving them with Jesus, and getting them out of the way. Now, if I have sinned against you, or if I've sinned against you as an individual, or if I have offended you or hurt you, then I need to confess that to you and say, look, I am sorry, please forgive me. And confess it. Get it out of the way. Because if you don't, you carry it on inside of you and it, it starts to pile up. And it's no wonder a lot of people are having nervous breakdowns today. They got things piled up so high, I'll tell you, they're a mile high. And then we wonder why we're nervous wrecks. I believe in getting things out of the way. Don't shovel them under the rug confess and forsake them. And then, of course, our physical bodies become well. 
the scriptures say, I want you to prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. So we put them all three together, and that's what we should do is be, be healed in the name of Jesus. I want you, please, to um, go back to Acts chapter 2 for just a moment because we're going to look at some of the reasons why people are not healed as well. And uh, then we're going to look uh, at some more inner healings. <clears throat> but here is the story again of um, the, uh, back in the early church. And this is Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through to 47. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common." and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with singleness and gladness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And then, of course, you will note from this point on all of the miracle signs and wonders that were done. One of the reasons, I'm saying one of the reasons, and this isn't the only main reason, but it's one of the reasons we want to touch on as many as we can. One of the reasons why people are not healed today is because the body of Jesus Christ is not in its proper place. When my body is healthy and well under normal circumstances, and I cut my finger, if a foreign uh, well, a virus or some kind of a disease or something is, comes in to try to get into my finger there through by way of the bloodstream. The rest of my body will rush to that cut or that bruise and will heal it so that it will ward off, first of all, infection. Or if I have been in an accident and I fall and hurt myself or break an arm or whatever, the rest of my body will rush to it, will nurse it, will care for it until it's healed and it is back normal again. But it does take that body that is well to be able to do that. Now, if the rest of the body is sickly and a person is extremely sickly, they're anemic, they are, they are, are absolutely, their, their whole body is sick. Then if they get some kind of another disease added to what they've already got, you can appreciate the fact that they come close to dying, right? I'd, I am convinced of this, that God is moving in such a way today that we are going to see the very things in a greater measure to what we're already beginning to see them. I don't think we've lived yet to see what God is going to do in the outpouring of his spirit yet. I know it's, it's happening all over. But I believe the body of Jesus Christ has got to get into its proper place. We are still so fragmented. We aren't really coming into the place where we have all things in common and we desire to help one another. Many churches are still busting knuckles, you know, still afraid to darken the other fellow's door, afraid somebody else is going to do something detrimental. And when the church of Jesus Christ comes together in love and in unity, and I'm not talking about everybody going out and selling their house, Please don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about the things that we have that we don't need and we don't have to use to share them then with somebody else. I know one man who was more than a millionaire several times over. And when he got touched by the Lord and filled with the Spirit, he said, look, I don't need those other three houses and those three big mansions. I've got one in this country and another one in that country and another one in some other country. He says, I'm going to sell some and I'm going to give it then to the work of the Lord. And let me tell you, God's moving mightily in that man's life. And so this is what it's talking about. God's touching people today so that we give unto others and, and impart unto the rest of the body. And when we do that, 
I'll guarantee you that we're going to see the very exciting things that God has spoken about, and we are yet going to see them in his name.